Hey again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and while I'd love nothing more than to be talking to you about the beautiful rose that's underneath this mound somewhere, unfortunately it's being covered over by this plant, bindweed, a voracious vine that is my least favorite weed altogether. There are probably two or three that give me a lot of trouble, but this one takes the title as my least favorite weed. Let me take you through it today, what bindweed is, uh, its life cycle, and what hope do you have to get rid of it from your garden once it started to establish itself. This rose is complicata, and you should recognize the compound leaves of the rose there. Now as I scroll up and to the left, those the larger simple leaves, those are from the bindweed, and if you look carefully here, you're also going to see this. This pinkish purplish vine here is what it's using to climb up the plant. And it will swallow this rose whole if I let it. So what is this plant? This vine is from the Convolvulaceae family, which is the morning glory family, and in fact that's its other common name. People will call it Morning Glory, even though it is slightly different than the uh, ornamental Morning Glory that we that we grow in gardens on purpose. This one you wouldn't grow on your in your garden on purpose. The other plant that it's related to is sweet potato vine. So the edible sweet potato vine, not the yams, the true yams, but the sweet potato vines are also from this family, just have a more tuberous root. And now a close-up of the flowers. Here we have the beautiful white fused flowers. And for those observant amongst you, yes, I have cleavers along the fence too. Yes, my, my fence line is a real joy. And the flowers are nice enough that if this thing were less of a pain, you might be even tempted to let it be. Unfortunately, it won't just be on its own. It wants to take over the entire world. And it does that through a set of underground runners or roots. Let me show you those. Well, here's a garden bed where I took the time and trouble to remove a whole bunch of bindweed recently, but I bet you there's some left over. Well, here you go. It's popped up again very quickly from the same spots and from the surrounding area. So I wonder what I'm gonna do is give this a little bit of a dig and see what I can show you for the roots that are underneath. There's another big section heading off in another direction. As I pull on that, I can feel it pulling back and it snapped off there. That's one thing that makes it tricky about handling this is that it's such a brittle root system that where it's wandered, you're not gonna be able to find all of the little pieces that break off as you try to get rid of it. I'm gonna keep on digging here. And oh, here's another big piece. Oh, and there you go. So that's just heading off in another direction. And I bet you if I keep on digging back this way, I'm going to find even more. Some people say that this can run eight or nine feet. That wouldn't surprise me. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Even as I dig this small area here, I'm finding it heading off in all sorts of directions. And as I pull it, it's snapping off. The cardinal sin in trying to control bindweed is to leave it alone for a while. Here I ran out of time early in the season, haven't had as much time to maintain this edge of my garden, and it's grown up this evergreen tree in a big way. If past experience is any guide, it will continue to grow up that evergreen all the way up to 25 or 30 feet if I let it, and that whole time it will be delivering all that energy right back down to that expansive root system that we looked at. Now the bindweed does tend to tangle together, so it's easy enough to pull off in big swaths all at once if you stay on top of it. The problem is that if you don't do that as a weekly task, you can't stay right on top of it. So at some point or another, if you want to control the bindweed, you're going to have to go back down and kill those roots. How do I propose that you kill these roots? That's the question. That's the million dollar question. And I have three methods to discuss here. The first of which I'm going to call the old fashioned way or the hard way, or maybe even the right way, depending on which direction you take it from. And that is to remove the top growth, to dig around and get as much of the roots as you can, to remove them from the location, and then to repeat that process 
over and over again until you've stripped the roots of as much energy as you can. What I like to do is use a piece of PVC pipe like this and mark the spot in the garden. That way, as I walk around, I'll remember I have 10 markers out in the garden in the areas that I'm trying to eradicate the bindweed and I'll place them around the garden like that. And then I'll go and I'll find my markers and then I'll dig in that area or look in that area and see if any bindweed is coming up. Now remember, this could take a long, long time to be effective. Every piece of root that's in there has a chance of coming back. And the more energy is in those pieces of root, the thicker pieces of roots, the more they will come back. So this may be a project that takes you uh, a little bit of time, hopefully not a lot, every week for the next several months until you see significant reductions uh, between the intervals between the times that the bindweed tries to pop up again. The second method I'm going to talk about is chemical. And I know as a 100% fact that I'm going to take a bunch of heat for even talking about using chemicals for weed control in the garden. If you are one of those people who for health reasons or for moral reasons or for other reasons would not use chemical controls in your garden, I respect the hell out of that and 100% support your, your decisions on that. And even to the extent that if you wanna go down into the comments of this video and want to share your reasons for doing that, happy to have you do so. I think everybody should get a good understanding of the full picture before they go ahead and use chemical controls in their garden. What I'm gonna discuss fairly narrowly in this, in this video is whether I, these are useful in controlling bindweed. And the answer is yes. Both glyphosate and 2,4-D, which are pretty common weed killers on the market have a pronounced effect on bindweed and will go down and start killing those roots. They won't probably solve your problem in one application. You might need three or four applications as you weaken the roots of the plant. One thing I will say is that even as it is a danger to that plant, it's also a danger to the other plants in your garden. So one thing I would recommend if you're going to go this route is to put down a spray barrier like this. So cover over and use like this to prevent, prevent the risk of spray drift in your garden so that you don't end up getting it onto the foliage or bark or stems of other plants. Uh, you'll notice a lot of shrubs do have a very pronounced reaction to even slight exposure to 2,4-D, uh, resulting in stunted growth and discoloration. Uh, I also should say on the chemical method that that is not available to everyone everywhere. There are some jurisdictions now that uh, restrict the use of garden chemicals. Uh, I know in uh, BC and Alberta here in Canada, there are some uh, some restrictions on using things like 2,4-D on the consumer end. So you may have to check what the rules are where you are. And the third method that I can at least talk about is the use of weed barrier fabric like this. This is a, uh, a geotextile, they call it, I guess, uh, which is intended to be a barrier. It allows moisture through from the top end down into the soil, but it does not allow weeds to grow up from it. If you put this down and you leave it down, what will happen is the, the roots will still send their leaves up, up underneath this, but they won't get any light and they'll die back after that. The problem is that they will then try to find their way around the edges of the fabric. So as you put this down, and if you maintain that as a, as a way to try to kill off your, your bindweed, you may have to check it on a weekly basis, at least for the first while, and then readjust the outside edge of the fabric so that your, two, so that your bindweed doesn't just escape around it and continue to feed energy into those roots. Now I have to say that landscape fabric like this is not my very favorite thing for soil life and as a mulch. I prefer mulches of bark, but in certain situations, including that where you have a persistent problem with a perennial weed like bindweed, um, and perennial meaning it's a weed that comes back year after year, unlike annual weeds, which are pretty easy to knock down or, or remove, but uh, perennial weeds can be a lot more difficult. So in that case, this is something that you can consider. As you can tell from the footage, my own battle with bindweed is far from over. I have a couple of handicaps in this matter, including a very large property and not enough time in the spring to follow up properly about the bindweed. What I usually do is let it grow quite large in the spring and then try to catch it up when I have a little more time in the summer and the demands on my nursery have come down a little bit. Exactly the wrong thing to do, as you may know from what I've already discussed. 
uh, in your own battle against bindweed, probably your key determinants of success are determination, hard work, and patience. Uh, I wish you the best in it. If anybody else has any comments or even methods that have worked well for them, I'd love to hear those in the bottom of the video. I will update you as my battle progresses.